All right, this is everything you wanna know about COVID-19 and the vaccine. Um, a lot has been going on here recently. Um, and uh, we're gonna go over a couple of things. My name is Dr. Valda Crowder. For those of you who are new to this webinar, um, I'm an emergency medicine physician. I've been practicing for 30 years. Um, and I've treated people across four pandemics, one mass shooting and two category five hurricanes. I put this presentation together to sort of be um, an evolving presentation as new science comes out and new things come out, but it will also have some um, slides that are some basic slides about COVID-19 because some people are joining us for the first time and some people have been on before. Um, you can follow me on askdr underscore v. The source documentation for this presentation is at askdrv.us. All of these webinars are dated because obviously this is a, a fast moving topic. Um, and so let's get started. All right, the structure is 20 to 25 minutes of slides followed by Q&A. Usually we end right around nine o'clock. During the presentation, everyone's in listen mode so that everyone can hear. Um, and I request that you put in your questions either in the chat icon or in the Q&A icon. You can put your questions in as we're talking. You can start loading them up now if you already know you have certain questions. Um, and then when the presentation is over, I start going straight to the questions and asking them, uh, answering them. Um, my thing is that all of us are at actually making day-to-day -day decisions about our lives. Um, and I wanna make sure um, that we address any questions you may have about that. All right, the intention is to keep, the web, keep webinar participants informed about COVID-19 science that will help you and your family stay healthy during this pandemic. The outcome is that you'll leave the webinar motivated to create or improve an action plan for yourself or your family. Some people may be motivated to create or improve an action plan for a broader community or organization. Could be for a sorority, a union, a school, a business, a university site, maybe any number of things, All right? So let's actually get started. 512,000 people, over half a million people have died from COVID-19 within the last year. Now, now, it's not just the number I want people to think about. This is the entire population of Miami, Atlanta, or Baltimore. So this is like in one year we lost everyone who lived in one of these three cities. It's also the same number of people that died in World War I and World War II combined. Globally, um, there's been uh, 113 million cases, 2.5 million people have died across the globe from COVID-19. Now, the United States is 4% of the world population, but we are 25% of the cases and 25% of the deaths. So we have uniquely not done well with COVID-19. What we're seeing now in our industry, which is unfortunate, is a lot of nurses are traumatized, tired, um, not able to get a break, um, and, and a lot of them are quitting. Um, some of them are uh, going into teaching. Some of them are just quitting and going into different professions. It's unfortunate at a time when we actually really need them. All right, I always tell people I'm not flying. I want to actually tell people why I'm not flying. This actually shows what's going on with all the different airlines. Um, basically, all of the airlines are requiring masks, um, but um, not all of them make mask available if you show up without one. So Frontier, Spirit, and Sun Country. Not all the airlines are cleaning their flights before every airline, uh, before every flight. Allegiant, Spirit, and Sun Country. Also, Delta is the only one that is still not selling the middle seat. Um, so of all the airlines, Delta is actually U.S. Airlines. Uh, Delta is the one that is actually uh, doing um, the best. But if you're on a loaded flight with two, two or two or 300 or even 150 people, you can be for sure that there's going to be someone on the, on the flight that either knowingly or doesn't know, doesn't, have, doesn't know that they have COVID. Now they are doing testing at various um, uh, airlines. These are, I mean, airports, these are the, uh, these are the sites. Um, this is all voluntary. Um, it's not required. Um, and um, you have to pay for it out of pocket. So um, it could be anywhere from $30 to $100, depending upon what sort of tests you're actually going to get. 
Um, we'll go into the various types of tests later on. All right, so for those of you who've been on here, we're gonna go through a set of slides that we've, you've seen before, as, both, as you all know, it's highly, highly, highly contagious. Minimum time to expose other people is 45 seconds. That is for the original COVID-19. Many of the variants that you're seeing, minimum time of exposure is as low as 15 seconds. When you look at the percent penetration, um, if you come in contact with it, 60 to 80% of the people who come in contact with it will convert and become COVID positive. It's both a droplet and an airborne, which is why we originally had the guidance to actually be three feet away from each other, and now it's six feet. Um, we recognize that it is both. Um, the droplets are larger molecules that, uh, that fall about three feet from the place of origin. Smaller particles are inhaled and they can um, travel much longer distances and remain in the air much longer. So this sort of gives you a picture of what it looks like. If you imagine that this gentleman here is COVID-19 positive, he could be singing, talking, yelling, shouting, coughing, sneezing, any of the above. Um, and the red particles are the, dro are the droplets and the gray is the airborne. Now, a lot of people ask me, you know, how far out do the gray particles go? Well, it really depends upon the temperature and the humidity. If the temperature is less than 52 degrees, those particles stay in the air much longer. And then obviously, as all of these droplets and airborne particles drop to the ground, they hit whatever's in their way, whether or not it's a park bench, uh, whether or not it's a handle to a door, it doesn't really matter. All right, let's talk about COVID testing. There's a PCR test, which is the gold standard that actually is most accurate eight days after exposure. It can be inaccurate if it's done too soon or too late. Um, the uh, rapid test, is uh, one that people have heard about a lot in the news. Um, the important thing about the rapid test is 30% of the time, it is negative when you really have COVID-19. So 30% of the time, the test tells you you do not have COVID-19 when you do. So a negative test, you need another one. A positive test is probably true. We've talked a lot about masks. Um, the, uh, the homemade mask up there to the to your to your upper left, you know, those are about 20, 20, 20 to 30 percent effective. The surgical mask, maybe a little bit 30 to 40. You really want to upgrade to a KN95 mask, which is on, on the bottom left. Um, those are uh, 80 to 90 percent effective. The Spirian half respirator mask is an N100 mask. Um, that is something um, that I use when I actually see COVID patients. People have asked me, where do I get the N95 mask? Well, they're at Costco. Um, I also saw them recently at Home Depot and Lowe's. Um, this is a hundred masks for two, $259. So they're roughly about $2.59 each. Um, Lowe's and Home Depot have them in smaller containers where you can get maybe 10 masks or 20 masks, et cetera. You know, a lot of people say, you know, hey, masks seem uncomfortable. I just want to show a picture. This is what it looks like when I actually am working and I have to put somebody on a ventilator. We use the laryngoscope and go down the back of their throat to actually put the tube down their throat. It is not comfortable um, and a mask is way more comfortable. Now let's talk about the six clusters of COVID symptoms. Cluster one, two, and three are the, are the, cl are the clusters of symptoms where you are most likely to be able to handle it at home and not be hospitalized. So that's blue light without a fever, blue light with a fever, or it can actually present like a stomach flu where you feel like you ate something wrong, vomiting, diarrhea. Four, five, and six, where you get fatigue, confusion, or a combination of respiratory and abdominal symptoms, that is the, those are the ones where you'll most likely have to be hospitalized. You may wind up in the ICU and those patients um, can sometimes, if it gets very severe, die. COVID toes is something you can see in younger patients. It may look like their, their shoes are too tight or they've been fraught, uh, uh, frostbitten. Um, this is part of the syndrome of the multi-inflammatory disease syndrome that um, you hear people talk about on the news. Um, I have seen this in adult populations as well, but it is more common in children. 
So let's talk about the patient outcomes. You have people who catch COVID, whether or not they're symptomatic or asymptomatic, they completely recover and they never develop symptoms again. Then you have people who catch COVID, whether or not, again, they can be symptomatic or asymptomatic, they recover, and then their symptoms return later. These are called long haulers. Often their symptoms are neurologic, uh, like problems with balance or recalling names of things, sort of like a brain fog, having problems um, with, with um, attention and being able to really focus. Um, about a third of the patients who have COVID-19 will wind up being long haulers. We will see COVID-19 long haul clinics being set up. Um, the other thing is that you have people who catch COVID and then five or six months later, they catch it again, which is a reinfection. Um, you have antibodies after you catch COVID for about three to five months. Um, then they begin to drop off very dramatically um, and you can catch it again. Um, and then you have people who have what we call post-ICU syndrome. They were in the ICU for a long period of time, seriously ill. Um, and then they have post-ICU syndrome, which I'll go over here. With the post-ICU syndrome, about 75% of the people have either cognitive, mental, or physical impairment. Um, some have renal failure and require dialysis, limb amputations. Um, we also see strokes because again, COVID-19 is not just a respiratory disease. It actually causes a lot of different things in the body, including clotting. Um, so about 50% of the young people who have a stroke cannot return to work. Um, and then it causes pulmonary fibrosis and decreased lung capacity. So about a third of the people report difficulties with normal activities like walking a block or house cleaning. Research, researchers have found much, much higher levels of coronavirus in the brain than in the lungs. So this actually explains why we're seeing so many people after catching COVID-19 that are having neurologic-like symptoms. So although the initial symptoms seem to be in the lung, the highest concentration of COVID-19 is actually in the brain. Now, what happens if you just found out you're COVID positive? You wanna quarantine immediately. And I wanna remind people, quarantining immediately means you don't go out for anything. You don't go out because you feel like you want a cup of coffee. You don't go out at all for anything at all. You stay in your room. Uh, 14 days is the minimum. If you wanna get tested after 14 days, you can. About 10% of the people are still shedding virus and must quarantine for 21 days. It is important that you have a pulse ox um, and uh, that is shown there to the right. They're about $30 on Amazon. Um, the first number, which is the SPO2, that is the number that we're looking at. In the photo that I have there, that is the 97 number. The 104 number is just your pulse rate. So the 97, you want that number to be 95 or above if you're a normal healthy person. Now, everyone should be taking zinc and vitamin D3 during this pandemic time. It is very, very important um, that you don't have a deficiency of zinc and you have a deficiency of vitamin D3. Um, those have been associated with, um, with worse outcomes. You wanna have a bathroom that's only accessible to you, a cell phone where you can call 911, not friends or family, because if you call friends or family, you will give COVID-19 to them. You can have people leave food at a closed door. You wanna open up the windows to your room or house so that you get a lot of ventilation, a lot of aeration. And then some people are even upgrading the filters in their HVAC system. A little bit about treatment plan. Obviously, a lot of people require oxygen. We talked about vitamin D and zinc. Famotidine is Pepsid AC. That is also important to have in your house during this time period. And that's used to decrease inflammation. Decadron is a, is a steroid that is used. We're gonna talk about the antibody cocktails. Um, they are by both Regeneron and Eli Lilly are the companies that have been approved. And then people who actually um, are in the ICU and we have difficulty ventilating them on the ventilator, then we put them on what's called ECMO, which is extracorporeal mechanical oxygenation. Um, and basically we take the blood out of their body, oxygenate it and put it back into their body. And obviously they're in a medically induced coma. Now, what I'm most want excited about are these antibody infusion centers. You wanna make sure that you know where is the antibody infusion center closest to your house. Where would you have to actually go? Um, these infusion centers are actually 
um, available to anybody that has symptoms within 10 days. It is important that you get to an infusion center within 10 days. Some infusion centers even have a criteria of nine days. So I tell people, do not wait. Um, getting the antibodies decreases your likelihood of hospitalization by 70%. So if you're 65 or older and you have symptoms and you are within nine to 10 days, you are eligible for antibodies. If you are less than 65, then you're eligible if you have a BMI over 35, which is probably somebody who's right around 30 or 40 pounds overweight. Diabetes, doesn't matter if it's type one or type two, getting any sort of immunosuppressive treatment or uh, chronic kidney disease. As I said before, immunity lasts for about five months. After that, you can get a reinfection. Now, let's talk about the vaccines. All right. Now, here's how the virus actually works. Inside the virus is your viral RNA, and then it's covered by this, what's there in a bright orange, it's covered by a fatty covering, which makes these, that has these spike proteins coming off the surface. The spike protein connects with the receptor protein, and that's how it clicks open and gets into your cell. Once it gets in, then the ribosomes and the RNA tells it to copy itself. And it copies over and over and over and over and over again. It is during this copying process that the infection has the opportunity to enhance itself, to actually make, to eat, to, to make mutations that actually allow it to evade either uh, antiviral drugs or shots. So the less a virus copies, the less like you'll, you'll see more mutations. When a virus spreads widely, then it, you're more likely to see mutations, which is what we're actually experiencing right now. So once it makes all these copies, then it reincorporates itself and it goes out and attacks another cell. And that keeps going over and over and over again. It happens in your lungs. It happens in your brain. It happens throughout your body. Now, how do the vaccines work? Messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is something that has been used previously in cancer treatments. Basically, messenger RNA um, tells your body to make a protein. So it's coded in this instance for the spike protein because that's how it gains entry into your cells. So once you get vaccinated, you produce the spike protein for the COVID-19, your body recognizes it, it creates antibodies, it attacks it, and it kills it. Now, when your body actually sees COVID-19 for real in the community, it's ready and it actually knows how to address it. Johnson & Johnson is a viral vector approach. It uses an adenovirus, which is a virus that causes the common cold, alters it so that it's harmless and combines it with some with synthetic material, again, the spike protein from COVID-19. And that actually teaches your body to actually um, create antibodies, attack the spike protein, and it renders COVID-19 harmless. Now, let's talk about this. <laughs> Pfizer and Moderna uh, are the ones that have been approved. Uh, Johnson & Johnson, I have that in red because you will probably see if it didn't come out today, it's probably gonna come out tomorrow. It's going to be given emergency authorization probably by tomorrow. Now, um, basically, um, the Pfizer and the Moderna are 94 to 95% effective. However, both of those vaccines were not tested during times of mutation. Johnson & Johnson is the only one of the three that was actually tested during the UK, the South African, and the Brazilian uh, variant. So the 72% is their effectiveness in the US, 66 is the effectiveness in South, uh, uh, South America, and 57 is actually uh, in South Africa. Uh, now, what's interesting to note is when they talk about effectiveness, that's effectiveness and actually uh, not getting the infection, um, but Johnson & Johnson, there was no one that was hospitalized and no one that died as a result of COVID-19. Pfizer and Moderna both two shots, Johnson & Johnson is one. They have a similar profile as far as side effects. Um, and interestingly, originally Pfizer had to be held in liquid nitrogen and they are now also 
um, lobbying to uh, the um, FDA and NIH to get their emergency authorization reformatted so that they only have to be in a freezing temperature, not a liquid nitrogen temperature. All right, so, oh, let me go back for just a second. AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca has not been approved in the US as of yet. Um, it actually had its clinical trial was um, stopped and then uh, restarted, um, but they are using it at the EU in Europe um, because at Oxford, Astra, AstraZeneca was made in conjunction with Oxford University in England. Um, the EU has decided to distribute um, AstraZeneca and its efficacy is up 7, 70%. So obviously there's some preference to actually get either the Pfizer or the Moderna shot. So uh, uh, EU has actually been telling everyone in Europe to actually get the AstraZeneca shot. Um, and uh, uh, Angela Merkel was telling everyone, please get the AstraZeneca shot. Um, but then she actually decided not to get it for herself. So again, I always tell people, follow what people do, not what they say. I get a lot of questions about what's in the ingredients. Um, this is what the FDA lists as the ingredients for the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. If you wanna take a screenshot of this, you're welcome to, um, but this is what is listed in, as the ingredients. Now, some people say is ethylene glycol or antifreeze in COVID-19 vaccines. The answer is no. What is in there is polyethylene glycol, which is commonly found in lotions, creams, and toothpaste. Um, it's actually used to help the vaccine uh, evade the immune system and stay in circulation longer. Got some questions about immune thrombocytopenia. I just want to be, this is a rare blood disorder where your platelet counts go down, goes down. And immune just means it's a reaction, it's an immune reaction from your immune system. So it can be asymptomatic. It can be associated with a rash or bruising, or it can be associated with bleeding problems. There was a New York Times article about this. At the time, there was 36 cases out of 31 million vaccines administered, and data is still being collected. I'll show you a little bit later in the presentation how to actually search the CDC vaccine side effect website. All right, so another question I get a lot of is, how, how, how was the vaccine developed so quickly, 11 months? Well, it wasn't developed in 11 months. Um, it actually started with SARS in November 2002, which is SARS-CoV. SARS infection was, resulted in uh, 8,000 cases, 810 deaths across 33 countries, and vaccine development started quickly after 2003. This is an article from 2005. So this is over a 15 year old article. And I put it in here because it talks about the SARS virus. And specifically, it talks about the importance of developing a viral vector approach and a messenger RNA approach in 2005. So this research was actually going on back as early as this. Now, SARS and COVID-19 are similar. They both have spike proteins to gain entry to the cell. Um, they both have caused severe respiratory symptoms and 80% of their DNA is the same. So that's how come it was very easy once we had developed a SARS vaccine to amend or adjust that for COVID-19. Had we had a pandemic with something that was not similar to SARS, it would have been a whole different story. All right, so let's talk about mutations. Um, as I said, they occur as a result of the copying. Um, they are normally monitored by genomic surveillance. In the United States, we do not have a lot of funding for genomic surveillance. That is something that is in the $1.9 trillion bill. Um, and if that passes, that will give us a better idea of uh, how much each of the mutations are in our country. These are the mutations that we know of to date. A UK variant, um, which looks like both Pfizer and Moderna actually work against it. A South African variant, which actually looks like it's one, it's more dangerous to children. And two, it's more likely to um, escape uh, the vaccines. And there may need to be um, a booster. I, I think both Pfizer and Moderna are working on a booster. Um, and then lastly, there's a Brazilian and California variant. Now, as of yesterday, we have a brand new variant. So there is now a New York variant, a New York City variant just came out um, 
I pulled this down uh, late this evening, about six o'clock. Um, I will add it to the list of uh, mutations. Um, this one also looks like it is able to, um, like the South African variant, uh, possibly um, evade uh, certain uh, immunotherapies. So we have another variant, and again, New York City variant. And again, if you look at these variants, all of them are coming from places where there was a lot of infection. So that means there was a lot of copy. All right, COVID-19 statistics, distributed 88 million, administered 66 million. So again, we're, we're getting there. Um, we will probably see, you know, when that number gets north of 150 million, we'll begin to really, really feel a difference in this. Um, let's talk about how do you get your vaccine. Um, the criteria uh, right now for a lot of states is you must be over 65, but there are some states that actually allow you to get the vaccine less than 65 if you have one risk factor. And certain states like Pennsylvania even include certain things like high, high blood pressure or being overweight. So let's look at how you can actually get this done. This is what the Maryland website looks like, and this is the Maryland vaccine locator site. Now, important to note, Maryland today opened up uh, m and Bank Stadium down in Baltimore um, to actually begin giving vaccine. Right now they're doing just a small number because they're getting it set up, but they are going to be doing um, almost a thousand, two thousand a day within the next week or two. Um, they're also giving it at the Baltimore City Community College and a couple of the convention centers. California, myturn.ca.gov. Um, some, some people on this call actually also uh, said that anywhere in California, you can dial uh, 211. And if you dial 211, um, you may have to be on hold for a while, but someone will come and actually um, take your information and determine whether or not you qualify for a vaccine. The White House um, also under the Biden administration decided to send um, millions of vaccines to retail pharmacies. So Walgreens, actually, you can get vaccinated. This actually, uh, you have to go in to their site and actually register on this little landing page and then see what's available. CVS, I'm gonna change this slide as of next week because CVS has added states to this. So if you go to this link, uh, this screenshot here is a screenshot that was good up until this week. So they have added 10 more states that they actually are uh, giving out vaccines. So go take a look at CVS. There's also vaccinehunter.org. Um, this, um, this is actually, uh, this is actually a CDC approved, what is it, vaccinehunter.org. Um, this actually, no, this actually tells you um, where, are, um, where are vaccines that you actually may be able to get, where are places where they may have extra doses, how do you go about doing it, all of that. Um, this is a CDC approved website. The CDC approved website is called vaccinefinder.org. This is new. So this is a new slide from Tuesday. This is new. This is a CDC approved website called vaccinefinder.org. It's done with, um, in, in conjunction with uh, one of the medical schools and the CDC. All right, now some folks had asked me about, uh, about uh, different conditions. Um, now, uh, uh, weakened immune system, the CDC says, yes, you should, should still get vaccinated, but be aware of the safety data. Autoimmune conditions, yes, you should get uh, vaccinated, but no data is available. Gillian Beret, Bell's palsy, the CDC says, yes, you should get vaccinated. Pregnant or lactating, this is very important. The CD says, CDC says you may choose to get vaccinated. Now, what's important about this is there is no information, there's no data on pregnant or lactating women. Pregnant women in general are at higher risk for catching viral infections. Um, they're saying that you can choose to be vaccinated because the, um, the, the, the vaccine does not cross into the placenta and does not go into the child. So that is why they're saying that you can choose. G6PD deficiency, um, someone asked me about that um, and they are saying, yes, the 
G people with G6PD deficiency can also get vaccinated. All right, so let's talk about these vaccine safety programs because a lot of people have asked, you know, how do they know if they're having a problem? What are they doing? So it's a three-pronged approach. VAERS is the Vaccine Adverse Effect Reporting System. VSD is a Vaccine Safety Data Link. And then there's CISA, which is the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment. So let's go over this. So VIRS, which is the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, actually collects data and analyzes reports of adverse events that happen after a vaccination. Anyone can submit a report, right? You can be a patient, a parent, a healthcare worker, doesn't really matter. Now, the Vaccine Safety Data Link System this is um, two networks of healthcare organizations across the country that actually monitor um, about, about 200 million people. Um, so within that uh, linkage or network, um, they're also tracking um, side effects. Then there is the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Project, which is done with se seven medical research centers across the country. Um, and they conduct clinical research studies to better understand vaccine safety um, and identify um, any sort of adverse events following immunization. All right, so let's first talk about VIRS. VIRS serves as a nation's early warning sign to monitor potential vaccine safety problems. Anyone, as I said, can report. This actual fact sheet is on my website. Um, a lot of people ask me whether or not they could actually search VIRS on the last webinar. So we're going to do that today on this webinar. This is actually the website that you actually go to so that that way everyone can kind of see. If you want to take a screenshot of that, you can. But that's basically um, where you go to actually get access to the surveillance system. Now, VSD um, is basically a um, the CDC's immunization safety office. And as I said, they they collaborate with nine healthcare organizations throughout the country. They use electronic healthcare data um, and also includes information on the kind of vaccine, what was given, the date of the vaccine, et cetera. Now, just so we're clear, this has been set up for any vaccine and they're do you're using this for protein as well. CISA, as it says, it actually um, has worked with seven medical centers those medical centers are Kaiser in California, University of Cincinnati, Boston, Columbia, John Hopkins, Duke, Vanderbilt, and also um, obviously the CDC. All right, a couple questions about, you know, when does my vaccine vaccination, when does it start to work? So if you get vaccinated on day one, for the first 12 to 14 days, this is for Pfizer, but it's similar for Moderna, for the first 12 to 14 days, you have no more immunity than you had before. So for the first 14 days, 12 to 14 days, you have nothing. Then starting right at about two weeks, you start to build immunity. For the Moderna vaccine, you get your second dose at 28 days. For the Pfizer vaccine, you get it at 21 days. Um, so as you build up, you get very close to the um, uh, very close to like maybe 80 or 85%. And then with the second dose, you actually get what you need to get all the way to the 95% and also for the vaccine um, to last longer. Now, what's important uh, about getting vaccinated in Israel where they vaccinate a lot of their uh, adult older population, they're now seeing the disease shift to younger people. And they're also noticing that 97% of the deaths are people who were not vaccinated. So it's very, very important. Um, a lot of people say, well, which vaccine should I get? I tell people, get whichever one you can get the fastest. Uh, Dr. Fauci agrees, this is a race. He says, get whatever vaccine you can get and that is available to you. These are just some photos of folks who've gotten vaccinated lately. I've got a couple people in here getting second shots, which is great. Um, if you get vaccinated, please make sure to send me your picture. I'll add you to our collage. All right, we're going to do some Q&A, but before I do Q&A, I want to actually show people the website to actually search. All right, so this is a CDC website where you actually uh, can get access to searching. Okay, here we go. All right, so now this is the actual platform here. 
um, you have to go down and say you agree with this disclaimer. Um, and then you can viewers data search. So if you want to actually, this is the reporting system. Again, it's for all vaccines. So let's say you want to look at symptoms, right? Then here you have to actually, uh, hold on, where it is here, where it says uh, vaccine products. You have to select which vaccine product you actually want to search because this is collecting data, as I said, on all vaccines. So I'm going to go to COVID-19 because otherwise it's going to give me search criteria around everything. But what's good about this is you can check and see, well, how is COVID versus, I don't know, the measles about something, all right? Then you can also do vaccine manufacturer. So let's say we're going to look at, we're going to look at uh, Moderna, okay? All right. You can put in all sorts of, if you want to vary it by age or sex or state, you can do all of that if you want to. You can put down dates, but I'm just going to do a general search here just so you see. I'm going to hit send. Um, I guess under vaccine manufacturer, I put two things. I had two items checked, not one. I had all. I need to unclick all. So I only have Moderna. Okay, great. That was confusing the system. All righty. All right, now I can go up here and I can report events that are more likely to occur so that the things that occur are more likely under events reporting. So as you see here, the things that happen the most are headache, pyrexia is a fever. So just so you know, pyrexia is a fever. So headache, fever, chills, pain, nausea. And then it goes on down, right, and you'll see all of the various, all of the various things, right? Um, now, what they do with this is one thing they do is they make sure, you know, that um, the, some of the things that you see in here, they want to check to see is this happening at a rate that's higher than it would normally happen um, in in the normal population. But as you can see, if you go down here, there's a whole list. This is a huge, huge. huge they ca they're capturing everything here whether or not it's related or not. But as you'll see in going down, some things they may have only had two or three cases of. And sometimes it doesn't make any sense. Like for instance, vitamin B12 is normal. Well, you would expect the vitamin B12 to be normal. So again, this is what it looks like to search this database. Um, and so, uh, and you can do this at home and you can really check it out and see what's going on.